I come to this sport to show who I am, to become the best. I'm world champion. I'm pound for pound number one. I defend my title three times. I win biggest fight in UFC history. You know, what else? Miracles are scarce in the MMA world. We witness some amazing display of strength, endurance, and tenacity inside the octagon. But miracles? Not in this realm. We know the game, and we know what it does to some of the toughest human beings on the planet. You bleed, you suffer, you are brought down the rock bottom at least once in your career. And no matter how good you are, this game eventually takes a part of you through a soul-crushing loss. Absolutely no exception to this rule. Or is there? Well, some guys can be named the GOAT for different reasons, but Khabib, the most dominant terror of all martial art. This guy is out here taking f***ing pity on his <laughs> opponents. No one is as flawless as Khabib Nurmagomedov. Not even close. I think that is the argument, right? Like, who is the GOAT? The only distortion, the only well-known outliers in the history of combat sports were Floyd Mayweather and Habib Nurmagomedov. The boxing world arrived upon a verdict long ago, but the jury is still out on Habib's place in MMA history. How do we begin? The monster from Dagestan was undefeated when he entered the UFC, like a whole bunch of fighters before him. And while a lot of people expected him to lose that zero, he never did, never came close. The MMA gods demanded his blood, but he never bled a single drop, never had a mark on his face despite sharing the octagon with some of the most dangerous strikers in his division. Habib defied every ruthless convention, every sacred law in the MMA world, and he left the octagon unscathed, and despite all that he had accomplished, he left us wanting more. Welcome to the fighting business. The second legend edition of the before and after episode is due, and for today, we'll be taking a look at the career of Habib Nurmagomedov his path of absolute dominance through the fabled lightweight division. Light, I'm gonna smash your boy, guys. It is impossible to have a perfect career in this ruthless game. That is not a general rule, but a commandment. But maybe in a lifetime or once ever, you will see a miracle. Habib's career was just that. Michael Johnson. By 2016, Habib was regarded as the most dangerous lightweight contender by all, and even the uncrowned by some. He was 23-0 in an infamously competitive division. And with UFC 205 coming up at Madison Square Garden, Habib started advocating for a title shot against then-champion Eddie Alvarez. Unfortunately for Habib, the UFC was dead set on having McGregor main event the biggest guard in the company. And during the contractual saga, Habib was used as a negotiating tool. I have 24 win streak, best win streak in this sport. You think I don't know nothing about this sport? You were used as a pawn in that game, and you know that's the truth. Alvarez versus McGregor was made the main event. The eagle remained on the card, and his new opponent was UFC veteran Michael Johnson. This bout was announced during the pre-fight press conference, so it was made last minute, but the matchup was intriguing and served as a litmus test to the undefeated Dagestani. We haven't seen him progress his game at all. You know, he's just been a wrestler to take guys down and hold them and beat on them. I hope he's uh, became great at other places or, or worked on his stand-up, and uh, I, I hope he tries to test it out on me Saturday. You know, I'm looking forward to that one. Several fights into his UFC career, and people were still wondering whether Habib would be able to replicate his dominance at the top of the division. Johnson was not a former champion, but he was coming off a vicious knockout victory over Dustin Poirier, and with his speed and power, maybe he would be able to crack the Nurmagomedov puzzle. How are you going to solve the riddle that is Khabib Nurmagomedov? Um, a lot of guys have gone wrong by sitting back and waiting. No, sorry, not me. I, I don't sit back and wait for shit. What were your thoughts on his performance against Daryl Horcher in his last fight? I know it was short notice, but some people are pretty critical of it. Sloppy performance, like always. Uh, slow, but... As far as this fight goes, what's your prediction? How do you see this one in? Knockout. Vicious, violent knockout. You were going to find out at UFC 205, and on that night, Habib was in the public eye. Earlier on in the evening, he was involved in a verbal confrontation with Conor McGregor himself. I saw video how he looked with uh, Tyron Wood the morning, and after my way in, when I go, he watched me, I say what? Maybe you think I'm Tyron Wood or Eddie Alvarez? I'm different. And now the world was watching him. Just how good was this dude? Once the cage was locked, the millions watching found out. For the first few minutes, Habib looked somehow annoyed by the speed of Johnson. But once he brought the fight to the ground, the mauling began. 
Johnson was beaten from pillar to post from the first round to the third, and in the end, he was forced to tap out to a Kimura lock that looked as gruesome as the fight itself. Habib was now 24-0, and after the horrific beating he put on Johnson, the more casual fans definitely took note. Not only did he dominate a game opponent, he was talking to him while he punched and elbowed his face in. Who does that? Habib went out of his way to pay respect to his opponent in a backstage interview. Thanking him for taking the fight, and Johnson later released a statement on Instagram declaring that Habib would be the champion someday. Habib had a massive chip on his shoulder throughout fight week, and with a performance like that, it was hard to deny. Conor McGregor was still nowhere in sight, but Habib had another guy in mind. Edson Barbosa. After the massacre at UFC 205, Habib demanded a title shot, but the undisputed champion Conor McGregor was still on hiatus and the UFC booked Habib versus Ferguson for the interim belt at UFC 209. These two were supposed to share the octagon before the fight fell through each time, and UFC 209 was no different. Something went horribly wrong with Habib's weight cut. He was removed from the card. The outrage towards Habib and his team was unanimous. Two years on the shelf due to injury, and now a botched weight cut. The MMA world was done with Habib, and there were some reports indicating that the undefeated fighter was considering retirement. He was having pains, either where your kidneys are, or liver, or something. I, I don't know the exact specifics, but he was having pains, and, and I'm sure you guys saw the picture. Habib, however, was not done. There was no way he was going to retire on such a bad note, and after a couple of months away, he came back and demanded a top contender. Edson Barbosa, one of the best strikers in the company, was available, and the fight was booked for UFC 219. Another dangerous striker well capable of knocking anyone out, and the pressure on Habib was immense. The backlash from the fans persisted, and his place in the division remained on shaky ground. When I go to the Octagon, I'm gonna show like how he improved my boxing game. Edson is like great striker, you know, he's one of the best in UFC. What happened if I knock him out on stand-up? Ferguson, his rival, was the interim champion, and Habib had to showcase something very special yet again. With everyone going after Habib and his love for tiramisu, Barbosa was the only guy who spoke highly of him and kept it classy. Habib is a great fighter, he's a true fighter, you know, I know if this contract comes on his hand, he's going to be signing. You know, he's definitely one of the best in the world, and one of the best in the world. That's going to be a great show. Habib had dealt with boxers with minimal issues, but how was he going to handle the leg kick of the most vicious Muay Thai specialist in the division? Edson was one of the most underrated fighters at lightweight, and he had given Tony Ferguson, who many considered the true champion, hell not too long ago. One precise kick to the lead leg, and Habib was going to have issues completing a single takedown. Habib advanced upon Barbosa as soon as the fight started, negating his best weapon and stalking him across the cage. Once he secured a takedown, the beatdown commenced. Kicks or punched, it made no difference for Habib, and for three rounds, the striker was mauled and just barely survived. Barbosa connected with a desperate kick or two, but the Dagestani Terminator shrugged it all off and won a dominant decision reminding everyone that he was still the most feared lightweight on the planet. Barbosa described the loss as painful because he did everything right. And even months after UFC 219, he had trouble digesting what had actually happened to him. What does make him so special inside the octagon? I think he he's very strong. He's mentally very strong, you know, because everybody know his game. Everybody know his game plan. And he go there and do it. The eagle was back on track. Before the fight, his Twitter and Instagram was flooded with tiramisu memes, but after another dominant display, Habib was in title contention. Connor or Tony, it didn't matter. I can fight with Tony, and after a couple hours, if you see give me rest, I can fight with Connor. Ally Aquinta. <laughs> Habib versus Ferguson, El Kukui versus the eagle, was once again the fight to make at 155, and with both lightweights on crushing win streaks, the hype was greater than ever before. UFC 223 was to play host to this legendary clash, and MMA fans around the world were praying that this match would remain intact. About that. He saw somebody and he turned to say hi to someone, didn't see some wires on the ground, tripped over some wires and just blew his shit out. Somewhere in Ireland, Conor McGregor was laughing. 
No wait, actually, Connor was in Brooklyn, and he stormed the arena in search of Habib, even throwing a dolly against the bus window to make a statement. Why you need to come here? Show up like you wanna fight or something like this? Send me a message, hey, come here, this place, and that's it. With Ferguson out and Connor on a rampage, the UFC had to do some serious brainstorming because Habib was still on a card and he was determined to take the lightweight belt to Dagestan by the end of the event. At first, Max Holloway was supposed to be Ferguson's replacement, but medical concerns ruled out Holloway and the search continued. Finally, raging Al Iaquinta was deemed the replacement. Iaquinta was supposed to fight Paul Felder, but desperate times called for desperate measures, and Habib versus Iaquinta was the only option. You'd have to pay me right now 200, two, you'd have to pay me $2 million to fight, a million dollars to fight Khabib. I don't want to fight that fucking guy. You see what happened to Barbosa? What are you, nuts? You know, I'm focused, I'm focused on going out there and just having fun, having fun, nothing, no pressure on my back go out there and do what I love to do. This was a last minute fight, so not a whole lot was said between the two, and the entire event was overshadowed by the absolute hell unleashed by McGregor. With the notorious one finally stripped of the lightweight championship, this was an imperative step to restart the division. But the hype was just missing. As good of a fighter Al is, he was ranked outside the top 10, and this was more ammunition for critics to unload against Habib. Regardless, the fight took place as scheduled, and Habib came out victorious. It was a rather strange fight, and some felt that Habib was exposed as he could not finish Ayakunta. But with multiple 10 8 rounds in his favor, it was a dominant decision by the numbers, and the Eagle was crowned the lightweight champion. Habib himself praised Al right after, calling him a true gangster for accepting the fight and hanging in there. In a TMZ interview a few days later, Al showed up, busted up, and sore, but despite a one sided fight, he was confident a rematch would look different. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. As long as he's at, you know, he's gonna stay at the top, I'm gonna see him again for sure. Regardless, Habib was the new champion at 155, but there was something amiss. Undefeated, unscathed, unstoppable, but not undisputed, at least not yet. Do you think that could be what had happened? Was just to try and get your attention for a future fight in the year? Um, well, they've got it the most popular superstar in MMA history, and the biggest fight in the sport awaited the new champion. Conor McGregor. McGregor. Habib versus McGregor had been brewing ever since UFC 205. Once upon a time, the two were sort of friendly with each other, but once they were both contending for gold at 155, the cordial relationship festered into hatred. The breaking point was when Habib slapped Artem Lobov. <laughs> McGregor flew halfway across the world to defend the honor of his friend. The MMA world was abuzz when McGregor made his long-awaited return, and the company announced this blockbuster fight for UFC 229. We have one more thing we want to show you. The fight is done. October, Las Vegas. It's on, ladies and gentlemen. This was the pinnacle of the sport, and once the two superstars shared a stage on camera, it all began. McGregor, the most successful showman in the sport, was determined to get inside Habib's head, and so he went all out, surpassing his own highlight by a mile. The trash talk was vile. Here's my location, you little fool, right in front of you. Do something about it. Do something about it. Yeah, you'll do nothing! Cruel and personal. I am going to truly, truly love putting a bad, bad beating on this little glass jaw rat. And Connor did not mince words and torn to Habib every chance he got. You bought me tea, George, a little fat yeah, little kid. Don't be like 2014. In 2012. No, 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 Twitter's I have a question. McGregor promised all that he was going to slaughter the biggest amateur in the professional league and knock his head into the nosebleeds. I've never met a tw an, unbeaten, an unbeaten amateur uh, in, in the professional game. I mean, he's fucking for nobody. And as composed as Habib was known to be, the Eagle lost his temper a few times in the build-up. Let's wrestle, kid! Much like every opponent of Conor before him, Habib was not just fighting the notorious one. He was up against the Irish population and the company itself. Despite being stripped of his belt, Conor was allowed to bring his two titles on stage and the label of paper champion followed Habib throughout. The biggest fight in the history of the sport was upon us and the two lightweights absolutely detested one another. This was do or die for Habib, a loss here to the bane of his life. He was never going to be the same again. 
McGregor had disrespected him, his home country, his culture, and his family. And one impulsive outburst of rage in Habib's head was going to come clean. In the main event of UFC 229, Habib remained calmed and composed. In the first round, he opted to keep McGregor on the ground and drain his stamina. And in the second, a massive overhand shot sent McGregor, widely regarded as the best striker in the sport, to the ground. In the takedown later, a violent catharsis ensued. McGregor was smashed on the ground, and despite managing to stay on his feet in the third round, the former champ champ could not put Habib away. Irate by the constant fouls and the bad refereeing of Herb Dean, Habib completed a takedown in the fourth round and forced McGregor to tap with a neck crank. It was over. The biggest MMA fight concluded, and Habib, now 27-0, was finally undisputed champion. He made an example out of Conor McGregor, but he did not stop there. All hell broke loose when Habib jumped the fence and attacked Dylan Dennis. McGregor got involved and a massive brawl took place inside the cage. Habib was then escorted to the backstage area and Bruce Buffer announced the result inside an empty octagon. One of Connor's guys was talking smack to uh, Habib and Habib just ran and dove over the octagon and went after him. While that was happening, two of Habib's guys jump over the octagon and go after Connor. Despite the insanity, the headline read, Habib defeated McGregor and the lightweight division was finally out of the shadows. As for Conor, well, the haunting continues to this day. Conor McGregor has not been the same ever since UFC 229. I dove in on one foot. My foot was a balloon. My foot was a balloon. An injury claims to random Twitter outburst directed at Habib. McGregor probably hates every fiber of Habib's being and will continue to do so for a very long time. That is the price to pay for a fight of this magnitude. The winner is immortalized and the loser is never the same again. With the paper champ label extinguished, the MMA world was finally starting to realize Habib was not just good, he was not just a one-dimensional wrestler, he was not just a generational great, we were looking at possibly the greatest lightweight of all time, and it was just getting started. Dustin Poirier After defeating McGregor, Habib became one of the biggest stars in the company, but due to the post-fight brawl, the undisputed lightweight champion was not able to compete for a whole year. While Habib awaited the decision of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, an interim title bout between Dustin Poirier and featherweight king Max Holloway main evented UFC 236, and Dustin had his hands raised by the end of the fight. Upon the nod from the commission, the unification bout was set for UFC 242. Tell your boy to get his together. Two Nigerian born champions two. on the same night and two Portuguese And Abu Dhabi was the host. UFC 242 will see one of the most highly anticipated matchups in recent memory to unify the lightweight belt. Despite having proven himself time and time again, the pressure was once again on the undefeated champion to orchestrate something truly special for his second title defense. UFC 242 was his homecoming, and his father and head coach Abdul Manap was in his corner. And across from him stood a very dangerous Dustin Poirier, hungry to continue his championship success. I feel like my whole career has, has groomed me and, and molded me for this night to capitalize and change my family's life, to write my name in the history books. After the impressive victory over Max Holloway, the skill set of Poirier was finally given due appreciation. A competent grappler and an outstanding striker with concussive power, Dustin was seen as one of Habib's toughest matchup, and Poirier himself was confident that he was going to crack the code. Yeah, I'm hoping to stop the guy, you know, but uh, I'll be prepared to fight 25 minutes, you know, at, at a grueling pace in the heat with people yelling at me and booing me. Beating Habib in Abu Dhabi in front of his father and becoming undisputed champion was an insane feat to accomplish, but Dustin looked as focused and determined as ever. And throughout fight week, he promised that he was going to make something special happen. It takes pressure, it takes confidence, it takes uh, years of, of sacrifice, and I've, and I've got all those things. In the main event of UFC 242, the two champions met in the middle of the octagon, and this was Dustin's chance to make something happen and etch his name as the first guy to defeat the seemingly unbeatable Habib. But Abdul Manap was watching from the corner and there was no way in hell Habib was going to lose this one. Like thinking like Dustin is like crazy guy. He think I'm gonna tap in front of my father. The suffocating and stifling pressure left Dustin with very little room to breathe. And while he landed a significant shot in the second round, Habib shrugged it off and continued the relentless pressure. A desperate guillotine attempt in the third round was the last gasp out of Dustin, and after escaping, Habib clamped on a rear naked choke, and Poirier was forced to tap out. 
second title defense in the history books, he looked as impressive as ever. The two shared a moment of respect in the cage afterwards, but Dustin Poirier was heartbroken by the loss, admitting that it was going to sting for a long time. Maybe I didn't try to get off the fence. I'm going to beat myself up about this for the rest of my life, you know. Uh... Dustin classified Habib as a fighter in a league of his own. It didn't have anything to do with crazy abnormal strength. It all came down to flawless technique honed by years of combat training and relentless ambition. Nobody, none of these guys that I fought feel crazy strong to where it's overwhelming, but it's just his position and his balance was so good. He knew where my weight was, where it needed to be to, to get in a better position. He's just so advanced. Directly after UFC 242, a familiar name was linked to Habib once more. Tony Ferguson was still the boogeyman at 155, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we were finally going to get the lightweight clash to decide the divisional goat about that. Justin Gaethje. The COVID-19 pandemic brought the world to a halt. And UFC 249 featuring the long-awaited lightweight clash was in jeopardy. Nobody wants to see sports return more than we do, but we didn't feel this was the right time for a variety of reasons. We will be the first um, sport back. Fight Island is real. Habib was stuck in Russia and was not able to fly back to the United States, but the UFC pushed ahead and arranged yet another interim title fight, this time with Justin Gaethje in the mix. UFC 249 took place in an empty arena, and on that night, the legend of El Kukui came to an end. Gaethje did to Tony what Tony usually did to others, and at the end of the fight, he was crowned interim champion. But Habib was nowhere in sight. I am truly sorry to hear of the passing of Khabib's father. Habib had lost his father due to complications from COVID-19 infection, and for a while, we wondered, is this it? The one guy who had been alongside Habib from his amateur days to his pinnacle was no longer there. But just a few months after this tragedy, the unification bout was announced for UFC 254. Habib was back, and yet yet another deadly striker, possibly the hardest hitter in the division, to contend with. People believe that this kid has the style of beat. So, you have all the ingredients for a massive fight. You have a big superstar, and you have a kid who's coming off an incredible uh, uh, win over a highly respected fighter. After mauling Tony Ferguson, Gaethje was seen in a new light. He was already destructive enough, but with the patience and composure he displayed against Ferguson, the highlight was seen as Habib's toughest challenge till date. McGregor and Poirier had good hands, Barbosa had wicked leg kicks, Gaethje had both, and he intended on using his complete arsenal. I'm going in there to create damage. Um, as soon as I chop his legs up a few times, he's not going to be able to, you know, explode like he wants to to get to my legs, get to my hips. We're not going to be on the fence. More importantly, Gaethje admitted that he wanted no part of Habib's on the ground, and wisely so. Thing that I have strived for every day is to never be held down on my back. When he gets on top, you know, I will have an extremely hard time getting back up because, you know, the way that he carries his weight, the way he covers you, um, he's not necessarily working like super hard. He's just constantly making you re readjust. Prior opponents of the Eagles, such as RDA, Dustin Poirier, and Edson Barbosa, thought they could hang with the champion on the ground, but Gaethje wanted to stay the hell away and fight his own fight. As he always did. I've used my wrestling my entire career to keep this standing. Uh, the quickest way off a mat was to pin somebody. The quickest way out of a fight is to knock somebody out. With both fighters managed by Ali Abdelaziz, you could easily call Gaethje and Habib's friends, but as the fight drew closer, the friendship took a back seat, and it was all about legacy and everlasting greatness inside the octagon. One victory and Habib would tie the title defense record at lightweight. But if Justin Gaethje, the most dangerous lightweight, was able to pull off the upset, he would rewrite history, beating Ferguson and Habib back to back. Insanity. Habib made the walk to the cage as he always did, stoic and focused, but the man was hiding a lot of mental and emotional pain behind the mask. And like UFC 242, his father was not by his side. Physically, he looked impressive as usual, but mentally, was he even there? Once the bell signaled the start of the fight, Habib was in the zone, and he did what he always did, march his opponent down relentlessly. Gaethje struck often with his patent leg kick, but Habib endured it all and nearly finished the fight in the closing moments of the first round. Gaethje was out of breath in the second, and Habib wasted no time, finishing the interim champion with a triangle choke to notch his third defense. I remember when I remember you didn't want to hurt Justin Gaethje, so you decided to get on top of him and uh, 
to the triangle show because obviously you knew that his mother and his father were in attendance. I understand maybe this guy is non tap and I'm gonna broke his arm, you know, in front of his parents. And I was like, and I transitioned to the triangle choke. Conor McGregor tapped out in the fourth round. Dustin Poirier was submitted in the third. Gaethje was stroked unconscious in the second. Just what was this dude made of? After all that he had accomplished, was he still getting better? That left no doubt, Habib was the greatest lightweight of all time. With just a few more defenses, he would be ranked amongst the likes of John Jones and GSP. But then he started removing his gloves, and nobody saw it coming. It was my last fight, and no way I'm gonna come here without my father. 29 and 0, best pound for pound fighter in the world, undisputed lightweight champion. Habib let go of all of that and called it a career after defeating Justin Gaethje. That was the last we saw of the eagle inside the octagon, and knowing his principle and character, we will probably never see Habib fight ever again. Later on, it was revealed that Habib fought through a number of health issues, including a broken foot and a viral infection. It was a horrific training camp to get through, but as Gaethje himself said, Habib was just not going to lose that night. And then uh, his why that night was absolutely huge, you know, with the passing of his father, him having the knowledge that it was going to be his last fight. He was almost impossible to beat that night. The most illustrious lightweight career came to an end, but we were left with an empty taste in our mouth. How long could he have dominated like this? I'm not sure anybody under 185 pounds in the UFC or in the world could beat that man. Habib was unlike anyone else in the history of MMA. The guy fought 29 professional MMA fights, but with the way he was improving, he could have made it to 50-0 without too many issues. He was just that good. Every new opponent of his was the chosen one to put an end to his undefeated streak, but Habib didn't just beat them. He made an example out of each one, his latest performance more impressive than the last one. It's all said and done now, so how do we classify Habib? The greatest of all time? Maybe not with guys like Jones and GSP at the top, the most complete fighter? That doesn't fit either, a force of nature. That fits well, doesn't it? That is the one and only way to define the career of Habib Nurmagomedov, the one guy who never lost, who never bled, and retired on top, and yet, he still didn't grant us closure. You can never get enough of surreal spectacle, and Habib was just that, an anomaly, the kind of which we might never see again, and let's be honest, he could have wiped out all two divisions, and we still would have wanted more.